Fox Sports. We are Fox Sports. We are Sports Out. For the Braves, the time might be now to make a move. Their next 22 games are against teams that are currently well below 500. This stretch begins tonight with the first of three against the Houston Astros. It's time to give Houston all kinds of problems right now on Sports Out. It's a hot, muggy day in Houston where we join you for what used to be one of the great National League rivalries. Now it's interleague play as the Braves face the Strohs. All season long, Braves baseball is brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. Everybody will be cool and comfortable tonight inside Minute Maid Park as the Braves are back in town. They are facing Bo Porter's 33 and 44 Astros. The Braves try to win their 39th game of the year and get back to two games over the final. 500 mark. Hi again, friends, with Paul Bird, Chip Carey. Welcome back to Houston. It's been a long time since the Braves have seen the Astros, and Paul, a very different looking Braves ball club tonight. They use the DH, and they also have a big lineup change at the top. Yeah, so Gaddis gets to take a little break, sit on the bench, enjoy himself, not block too many baseballs. And then B.J. Upton in that leadoff spot. The Braves need more production out of him. They're trying to move him into that spot to see if they can get it. Uh, right there at the top. Hopefully Atlanta can improve its fortunes in interleague play. They're two and seven against the American League. But Paul, maybe the Astros are just the tonic for the struggling Braves ball club. Yeah, no guarantees here, but the Astros have a very young team, very aggressive, and we'll see if the Braves will be able to capitalize on those opportunities. Young Houston club facing a veteran right-hander, Aaron Harang. He's seen the Astros a lot, what with his days as a member of the Cincinnati Reds, and look at what he's done of late. Last six starts against Houston are incredible, and he had a rough outing last time, so it's important that he bounces back, uses that youth against themselves, that aggression, and turns in a good outing for Atlanta. The Braves and Houston had a great rivalry during their National League heydays. They are indeed familiar foes. A lot of wonderful moments between the Braves and Strohs, and when we come back, Tom Hart will talk all about that as we come your way from Minute Maid Park next.
Atlanta Braves baseball is presented by AT&T U-verse, Delta Airlines, and Ford. So we are indoors in downtown Houston for the first game of this series between the Braves and the Astros at Minute Maid Park. As Chip said moments ago, this was a great National League rivalry. What made it great? Postseason moments that many will never forget. For some, it was Walt Weiss with his diving stop up the middle. For others, a young Brian McCann taking the rocket deep. And yes, the longest postseason game in Major League Baseball history. But then the Astros were off to the American League. In fact, we haven't been here for a couple of seasons. Last time the Braves were in town. Chipper Jones was coming off the disabled list, and he returned with a bang. In fact, his first time up, he had a base hit. Later in the game, he took a fastball deep. It was special to everybody in a Braves uniform, even those in the stands that weren't wearing uniforms. Said his dad that night, he had a slider for it on the first hit. See what he can do with a fastball. He put it in the bleachers. It's a long and storied history. 701 regular season meetings, but all as National League opponents. The Braves have won the last seven series versus the Astros and have won 16 of the last 21. Added to that last time the Braves were at Minute Maid Park, well three Braves were wearing Astros uniforms. Chris Johnson was a third baseman. He had a triple and a double. Jordan Schaefer and David Carpenter were also Astros. Only four current Astros have even appeared in more than 10 career games against the Braves. So it's time to get to know the team on the other side. Freddie Gonzalez and his former player, Bo Porter. Evan Gattis in the lineup. And yeah, a new look for B.J. Upton. See what this lineup looks like tonight right after this. your Atlanta area Mazda dealer. I, I got to tell you, Paul, I love coming to this ballpark. I love coming to this town. I understand why the Astros had to move to the American League, but for Braves fans, it's a real shame because the Braves and Astros was always one of the highlights of the Major League schedule. One of just a great rivalry in baseball, even the playoffs. You always seem to see them lock up, and yeah, it's very weird for me seeing them in the AL. Well, hopefully Atlanta will have good luck against Houston. They have not had good luck against the AL so far this year. Maybe that'll change with this Toyota starting lineup as we've talked about it a couple of times. Evan Gaddis gets to DH. The Braves add a bat, a much needed bat for an offense that struggled the last two games against Washington. But the change at the top of the order, Lestella and Upton change spots. Upton first, Lestella second. We'll see if that sparks things for Aaron Harang, who faces the Astros for the 28th time as a major league starter and Paul a pretty tough customer opposes Atlanta in game one tonight. Scott Feldman the veteran 
He's got more starts in the big leagues than all of their other starters combined. So he's their veteran, and you can see did very well in April with that low ERA, 169. And then just has slowly uh, gotten worse, not seemed to get it going, but his last outing was okay, two runs in the, uh, you know, five innings. But his four keys to the game are this. Slot machine. And I'm using that term because he changed his arm slot in the last game. He has to raise that arm up. It was a new slot that he tried and had some success with it. Got that big curveball, so we'll see if that helps. And then he's got to regain the confidence that he had in April where he was pitching so well. And um, for him to do well, just remember how good he's been for so long with that good 10-year big league career. Kelvin's always been known as a ground ball pitcher. He'll rely on his defense tonight, as you'd expect. They've let him down a little bit this year. They've given up 10 unearned runs against Scott so far this year. Grossman, Fowler, and George Springer, the very heralded right fielder for Houston. Jonathan Singleton, also a big slugger at first base. With the hits leader in Major League Baseball, Jose Altuve at second. Jonathan Villar, the shortstop, former number one pick. Matt Dominguez at third. And Jason Castro is the man behind the plate. That's right, Jose Altuve, all 5-5 five, five of him, leads Major League Baseball and hits with 103 of them. And he's going to be a fun story to follow in this series with the Astros tonight. He's a spark plug. Let's hope this man can be a spark plug for the Braves offense as B.J. Upton leads off for the first time for the Braves this season. What they're looking for out of B.J. here is just to continue to hit the ball to off field. He's only got one hit against the Nationals, but he was hitting the ball better. We'll see if it continues today. Upton at 202 for the season. And Feldman delivers a called strike, and we're underway. Yeah, the top of the order for the Braves, a big problem against the Nationals. They were a combined three for 34. Upton was one for 18. And he didn't get that pitch up in the zone. It's nothing in two. It may sound strange, but the Braves keep hitting coach Greg Walker keeps a hard contact percentage sheet. And BJ has been hitting the ball better. And they're hoping that one, one hole really help him to be patient and just take an easier swing, which I agree with, because at times I think he can overswing as a hitter and try to do too much. There's a ground ball hit toward VR at short. And on a 1-2 count, Upton is out number one. So BJ put it in play, but he's retired to start the ball game. And here's Tommy Lastella moving up into the number one spot. Paul accomplishes a couple of things. It breaks up what could be three left hand hitters if Jason Hayward leads off. Secondly, it gives Lastella, who's been a good contact hitter, a chance to move runners over if they're on ahead of him. And I think maybe takes a little pressure off him from leading off. I would agree. And I don't think they're saying BJ Upton is our best leadoff hitter. I think they're saying, let's try it, and let's see if we can shake it up. They don't have a whole lot to lose. And Lestella has just been, in my opinion, fantastic coming up and showing that he can hit the ball at the big league level, nicknamed the singles machine, and he's earning it. Tommy at 302 for the year. More walks than strikeouts. In Lestella's first 23 big league games, another reason why you like him hitting second in the order. I agree. He showed nice plate discipline. Didn't get that pitch. It's a 2 2 count. So Feldman's going to show you a sinker, a cutter, a curveball, a change up. As we talked about, he's moved his arm slot up to the top. His biggest out pitch is that curveball. He has to command that curveball. Here it's 2-2. Lefty, let's see if he goes to it. And he doesn't. He sticks with that fastball. But it's a big, slow curveball, and when he's on, he drops it right behind home plate, bounces it, you know, get a lot of swings and misses. For him to do that, he needs to elevate that fastball, throw a high fastball, and then work the curveball off of it. 
There's the breaking ball and La Stella took it low full count. Freddie Freeman's on deck. He had a huge series against Washington. He'd love to bat here with a man aboard in the first. To see that pitch right there, back door, little cutter to a lefty. Not a whole lot you can do with that. Listella just fouls it off. Nice, easy swing, just fouls it off and works the other way, fighting off to live to see another pitch. Boy, pitching away to left hand hitters in this park has to be a dangerous <laughs> proposition with the Crawford Cox is 315 feet away and left. You have to be careful. This place reminds me of Fenway Park a little bit, only half the Green Monster. As you can see, much shorter than the Green Monster in Fenway Park. And yes, you're right. If lefties can go the other way, they get rewarded. Tommy tried to and pops it up. VR and Dominguez gather. It'll be Dominguez, the third baseman, in foul ground. And Lestella's retired for the second out of the inning. And here is Freddie Freeman. Freddie's good work earns him our Georgia lottery hitting the jackpot honors. A 405 average for Freeman and nine for his last 19 with a homer that came against the Nationals. You can see the shift on for Freddie. They believe he's going to pull the ball on the ground and then even in the outfield they're shaded over a little bit in that gap in left center. So what they're saying is hey if you hit it on the ground we think you're going to pull it. We're going to play our outfield straight up, but we're going to move our left fielder over because you have so many hits in that opposite field gap. There's a shot hammer toward right, and Springer, in a couple of steps, makes the play to retire the side. Feldman gets the plays in order. Aaron Harang goes to work in the bottom of the scoreless first. Have struggled of late. They've lost seven of their last ten ball games. They're 14 and a half games out of first place in yes, the American League West. That still sounds so strange to say. Bo Porter's their skipper, and his Toyota starting lineup has Dexter Fowler and Jose Altuve. You see what Altuve has done: highest average, most hits in Major League Baseball. Amazing. George Springer, John Singleton, two sluggers in the middle of their lineup. You know Aaron Harang knows all about them as the Astros go to work here at home. Aaron Harang showing you right there with the nine home and six road starts that he's been very consistent. Pitched well at home and on the road. And his four keys to the game are this. 
remember the past, as Rafiki told Simba. You got to remember the past. He's pitched so well against them before. And then don't get caught speeding. As you saw, young guys can hit the fastball. Don't throw too many fastballs over and over. He's got to mix all of his pitches. So former Colorado Rocky and Atlanta native Dexter Fowler leads off for the Astros. Beware of Fowler's power as he skies one toward left. Justin Upton near the line in the corner is going to have room. And Fowler flies out for out number one. Always good to get a speedy leadoff man. That's what Haran did as you take a look at the impressive numbers of Jose Altuve, our Academy Sports and Outdoor Leaderboard subject. What I like about this guy, five foot five, leading the league in hitting. I tell people, Chip, I can't post up Shaq. I'm going to get dominated. <laughs> I can't cover anybody in the NFL. But in baseball, short, right handed, scrappy, I can play in the big leagues. The same with this guy. Only Troy Tulowitzki has a higher batting average among qualifiers in Major League Baseball. And you're right, Altuve, five five. Takes one letter high for a second strike. Slider that he hung just a little bit right there. You have to be careful with this guy. He hits highest average off of curveballs and struggles a little bit with fastball away. That was away. Hayward near the line. The stands come awfully quickly, and Altuve gets a swing on the house. Which confuses me just a little bit. That fastball away, usually if you're a high average guy, you can hit the ball away because 70% of strikes on that outside corner. So when you have a guy high average like that, that struggles with the fastball away, it tells you he doesn't miss anything else. Laird smothered that one low and outside. It's a ball and two strikes. The thing that makes Altuve so tough, he doesn't strike out much. Only 23 strikeouts and over 300 at bats. And when he gets on, he runs. He's stolen 26 bases, so almost like a second leadoff man on this Houston lineup card. And he is spoiling a couple of harangue pitches. Baseball is one of the few sports that, if you have short arms, it's good because you can. Get that bat through the zone, as you can see right there. Get to the inside pitch and swing a big enough bat to still get to that ball away. A lot of great hitters having short arms. To short, Simmons scoops and fires in time to out. Oh, I know a lot of broadcasters with short arms, but that's a <laughs> story for another It works time. up here, too. Yeah. I got you. Two outs for Springer. This young man has really raised eyebrows with his Astros fan base and it's a beaten down fan base they've lost 100 games three straight years they've moved to the American League times have been tough but Springer is maybe the first big name in what should be a very productive Houston farm system pipeline I was watching him take batting practice and I got a little scared had to scoop back a little bit his swing was so powerful and he was crushing balls out up on the train tracks. Um, and I only saw him take out one to right center, so likes to pull the ball. This one's popped up right side. Freddie gives chase near the stands and play. Springer was the number one pick in 2011. He was drafted when Ed Wade was the general manager here. Wade was relieved of his duties and Jeff Lunau took over in December of 2011 and has continued to build this Astros system with a lot of very high draft picks. And this one's hammer deep center. Upton on the run near Towns Hill. That ball is gone.
It's 436 feet away to dead center, and he hit a laser beam. One nothing, Houston. He crushed that ball. Lang just misses with a fastball up over the middle part of the plate. And as you said, Chip, that is a long, long way showing you just how electric that swing is and how much power he has. 14th home run for Springer. That gives him the overall team lead. And now John Singleton steps in. Sixth time this year, Singleton's batted in the cleanup spot. And he unloads deep to right. And foul. Springer's home run, Paul, 441 feet. Foul back toward us. There's that nice curveball from Aaron Harang. What I do like about Harang versus the Astros is he has so many options. He can throw a curveball, a slider, a changeup, a sinker, cutter, move the ball in and out, which against young players very effective. Springer was originally a Philly. He came over with Jared Cosart, Josh Zide. And a minor league outfielder for Hunter Pence at the deadline in 2011. There's that nice breaking ball in the outside corner. He was given a day off last start just to relax. Springer was. You don't always want your fourth hitter hitting 200. And that one played off to the side by La Stella, and Singleton's retired for out number one. George Springer hits a tape measure home run with two outs in the first inning, and it's one nothing Astros in front. Kevin Gaddis gets things started for the Braves in the second ball, and he's our Zaxby's indescribably good play. The best part about this highlight is you're going to see right there, balls going to left field, balls going to right field, him hitting sliders, fastballs. He's been fantastic with that huge hitting streak, very deserving. Evan was matter of fact in Washington after that streak came to a close. Hey, I'll just start another one. Had to end sometime. And as you see the historic proportions of that 20 consecutive game run as the Braves catcher. He's the DH tonight. And Freddy Gonzalez told me before the game the plan for Gaddis is to be the designated hitter in two of these three games with Houston. Especially in light of the fact that he caught five days in a row. Something he'd never done before. So day off yesterday some defensive rest against Houston. And then the Braves will turn him loose against the Phillies next weekend. There's that big curve ball by Felton. He just misses high. Gaddis was a DH in Venezuela. Liked it a lot. Said it gave him the opportunity to really focus and study the pitcher instead of worrying about catching. 
Didn't get that pitch two balls and a strike. I think that's a funny thing too in the American League depends on who you ask. Some guys love it. Some guys hate being the DH. Yeah, I think if he had to do it over and over night after night he wouldn't like it because he enjoys being a catcher. But every now and then gives him an opportunity to get a little break. And focus in on that pitcher and let's face it he proved last year he can come off the bench and do the job. So Evan digs back in with a two ball two strike count. And he chased the ball in the dirt. And Gaddis is going to be called out. By home plate umpire Bill Welke. Ball got away from Castro. But I think Evan kicked it away from the catcher and that's why he'll be rung up by the home plate umpire for the first out. Dad is chasing that big curveball we talked about that's necessary for Feldman to be successful tonight. As you can see and then he hits it again and then it hits his leg running out of the box. You're out twice. Here's Hayward. And Jason takes a called strike. Hayward at 256, eight homers, 29 knocked in. Braves really like seeing Jason hit in the middle of this lineup. He's been on base an awful lot in the fifth spot. There's a shot deep right center field. That ball's locked. Springer on the run. He can't get it. It's off the base of the wall. Look at Hayward fly. He's headed for third, and he'll dive in with a triple. I'd pay money to watch this guy run the bases alone. Watch this. Curveball. The first pitch curveball that Jay Hay took for a strike. He wasn't going to miss it. And as I said a few days ago, I'm from Kentucky, so I can say this. Look at Sea Biscuit go. Dives into third with a little trademark Pete Rose. Dive into third base. Very exciting. So he represents the tying run for the Braves here in the second, and Justin Upton's the batter. Got to get Justin going at the plate. Hey, hey, thinking triple all the way right there so that he could get the third with one out. So now a sack fly. If Justin can hit a deep fly ball, it'll score him. But I don't recommend left field for the sack fly with that short porch. And maybe that will help Justin Upton. Look at what he's done over the last 20 games just five RBIs. Yeah, he has struggled. He's uh, always been streaky. When the smoke clears, he's going to have pretty good numbers. But you have to put up with uh, the hills and valleys through the year. Strike one from Feldman. And that's out of play. Foul. Right into the third deck. Talking to hitting coach Greg Walker, and the key for him is if you watch those hands go down, that's his timing. It's not his hand-eye coordination. It's sometimes his timing mechanism is late, and he really needs to get those hands moving sooner rather than later. Breaking ball, scorched foul by an eyelash at third base. Upton missed an extra base hit. And he heads back to the plate. How close was this? One ball, two strikes. Feldman's a big guy. He's six seven. You'd think all a guy six seven is going to be grunting and grinding at 94, 95 miles an hour. That's really not his game. No, he's a sinker, cutter, changeup, curveball, a little bit of everything. Throws the kitchen sink at you. 
and you're going to see some balls that he's going to try to throw up in the zone, fastball, and follow with that big curveball that starts on the same plane and see if he can get a swing and a miss. The reason I bring up Feldman's height is he's the third tallest pitcher in the history of the Astros franchise. Remember J.R. Richard? I remember. He was 6'8", and there was one guy a little bigger, Randy Johnson, the big unit. Two balls, two strikes. Hayward at third, one out, one nothing. Houston. And Upton didn't offer. That's where teams have gone to get him. And now Feldman faces a full count pitch. There's that high fastball that he needs to be successful. But Jay Upton did not chase it, which is great. Now it's 3-2. It's hard to throw a curveball 3-2 because it's a low percentage pitch that gets called for strikes. So now I expect him to go back to the fastball. And Upton didn't get it. That had some sink to it. And Justin strikes out. Hayward at third for Chris Johnson, a former Astro. Two out. This is the comebacker. Pitch that starts off looking like a ball and just barely comes back and nips that corner or not. But it was definitely too good a pitch to take. And Justin Upton just swinging through it. This should be a familiar place for Chris Johnson. He got to the big leagues in 2009 with the Astros. Played here 2010, 2011, 2012 before he went to Arizona and, of course, joined the Braves last season. Chris didn't think so. He too though riding a hot streak for the Braves offense 13 hits in the last eight games. He's 13 for 33 in that stretch. Braves would love a two out knock here. Astro smothers that ball at the plate two and one the count. Jay Hay at third you can see Altuve playing up the middle. A lot of Chris Johnson's hits. Go up the middle or just over second base into right center as he is very good. There you can see Altuve working up the middle. Chris Johnson is very good at inside outing the ball and just hitting it towards pitched. That ball's headed for the right center field gap. That ball's going to get down and roll to the wall. Springer has it kick off the end of his glove, and Chris Johnson with two outs doubles home Hayward, and the Braves have tied the score. That is a huge base hit right there to tie up the game with two outs. Justin Upton unable to get that sacrifice fly. This is your teammate picking him up. You see that sinker inside on the hands. Watch how he keeps the hands in and inside outs it. Just a nice and easy swing over second base in that right center field gap. Nobody does that on this team better than Chris Johnson. He now owns a nine game hitting streak. He's in scoring position for Andleton Simmons. Gerald Laird, the catcher, is the ninth place hitter. Remember, the Braves in the AL ballpark are using the designated hitter. This is Feldman's 20th pitch of the inning. And it was a good one, a strike. Look at where Jonathan Singleton's playing at first base. He's about 35 feet off the first base line. What an inviting target that could be for Ampleton Simmons, who's Paul tried to hit the ball the other way an awful lot of late. That last series against Washington wasn't always rewarded for it, but Ampleton Simmons worked line drives the other way. So I wouldn't be surprised if a ball went down that right field line and the Astros regretted their defensive alignment. Would that tendency be something the Astros have in their scouting report for Feldman to get ready for his matchup with Simmons tonight? It would, especially because Feldman throws a sinker. And so the sinker is hard to work the other way. Chris Johnson just did it. But in general, it's hard to work the other way. Another thing is this. Singleton's got to get back to first. Ball's hit a ground ball to the left side. And he's off almost to the point where it's going to be a bang-bang play at first. He's a good 30, 35 feet away from the first base bag. 
With an even count for Simmons, big lead for Chris at second. And a breaking ball is sky to center, and Dexter Fowler retreats a step for two. And he makes the play to retire the side. A couple of extra base hits for Atlanta ties the game on Chris Johnson's two out double. Jeep and AT&T mobilizing your world. We hope you'll spend the 4th of July weekend with us at Turner Field. Get your tickets today to see the Braves battle the Diamondbacks Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, July 4th through the 6th. What better way to celebrate Independence Day than by experiencing America's pastime and the best fireworks show in the Southeast. For tickets and more information, log on to Braves.com slash tickets today. RBI double for Chris Johnson ties the game as the Astros come up in the home second and Matt Dominguez leads things off. Dominguez on pace Paul for a 20 homer season with the Astros and might be one that the Marlins let get away a little early. He was originally a number one Marlins draft pick. Yes, remember they, player. Remember who the Marlins got from Matt Dominguez? Carlos Lee. Ah. Gotcha. He's now out of baseball. Dominguez has had a, an approach where he's very tall right there. And you see him at times not get in a crouch soon enough. When he stays tall, that bat gets loopy, drops the bat head. He can be prone to that pop up. You see him crouch at the last second here. To short. Simmons scoops and fires to first. Moran getting the ball on the ground in this ballpark. That's always a good idea. Three ground outs, and that's the first of the second inning. And I don't know if the Astros know it because they didn't play the Braves last year, but don't hit it to our shortstop. Unless you want to get thrown out. Anthony Simmons. What I like so much about Anderson is he doesn't just to make the incredible play, but he makes the consistent play as well. Now Harang will face the catcher Jason Castro, who takes a strike. There's that nice first pitch curveball, first pitch breaking ball against the young, aggressive Houston Astro team. Bo Porter, skipper for the Strohs. He and Freddy Gonzalez worked together down in Miami. Bo also is coached with the Nationals. His first big league job is one that's full of promise, quite frankly, Paul. I asked him before the game, was this what you'd expected it to be? 84 and 155. 
As Castro shoots one into right field for a one out hit. Win totals for Houston the last three years 56, 55, and 51. So a former teammate of mine, good guy, the youngest manager in the big leagues. He said the biggest challenge for him is coaching young guys who've not faced failure. When you come up to the big leagues, you have to be able to handle adversity. He says he tries to stay positive for that buddy. And as you can see, not a great record this year, but far better than last year. And again, that first pitch breaking ball from Harang, where he's using the aggressiveness of the Houston Astros against themselves. Well, for a young, for a young Houston team, Chris Carter is really an exception for this team. He's a veteran guy. He's been around a while. Played with the Oakland A's. This is what Chris Carter does. He strikes out a lot, but boy, when he connects, it goes a long, long way. He's flirting with the Adam Dunn numbers, where you're all or nothing. There's certainly value in that to some teams. Some teams uh, drives you crazy. Other teams put up with it. I think teams like the Red Sox or the Reds, where you'll have a small porch, small field, his value would increase. One ball, two strikes. And that missed low to an even count. Carter was originally a Chicago White Sox draft pick. He went to Arizona for Carlos Quentin, then went to Oakland in the Dan Heron deal at the end of the 2007 season. And the Astros got him before spring training in 2013. Last year, 29 homers for Houston. But 212 strikeouts and 506 big league at bats. And if you notice Harang right here, just taking his time, really trying to settle in and throw the right pitch. He's even looks like he's holding Castro on a little bit. He's not. He's making sure that he relaxes and holds the ball. Line drive softly hit into center field. Carter aboard with a one out single. Well, that sounded funny coming off the bat. Did Carter break his bat on that pitch? I think he did. Unfortunately, that's one of the few pitches that Carter can really get to. Struggling with the ball away. That's what Laird wanted. He just didn't get it, get it out there. Through the broken bat. This is Robbie Grossman. Up and down here for Grossman between the big league club and Triple A. Grossman made the team out of spring training, played in each of the first 14 games, and then went to Triple A on April 15th. Hit 299 with Oklahoma City, with the big league club hitting 164. Got the corner there quickly 0 and 2. Nice comebacker by Harang. Pitch starting out looking like it's going to hit the left hander's hip and then drifts back over the plate for a strike. Really pitching everyone backwards so far. Breaking balls early, trying to close them out with a fastball. Let's see if he goes back to the curve here. He did, and Grossman's retired on three pitches. So Grossman's struggles continue. Two on, now two out, and Jonathan VR the shortstop hits. What's nice about this curveball, he wanted it down, he missed his spot on the outside corner, but what set that up was the curveball down the middle for a strike, pitch number one. Hitter lays off of it, but he knows that you can throw it for a strike. So when you come back with two strikes with that breaking ball, the hitter's much more prone to swing at it if you've shown the whole game that you can throw it for strikes. Here's another acquisition by Houston, Jonathan VR. He was originally with the Phillies. The Astros got him on July 29th 
with Anthony Goes and Jay Happ for Roy Oswalt. So while the Phillies were in the middle of their great Eastern Division run, they went early and often to Houston for very important playoff pieces. No balls and a strike. And that spins high. You saw that graphic they showed six out of nine first pitch strikes by Harang. One of the pitching coaches Roger McDowell's motto is strike one. Things are so much better for you when you get ahead in the count. The averages are different. Hitters are going to swing at more pitches. As you can see right there, Harang starting to exploit the youth of the Astros. First pitch breaking balls and he gives you a fastball away, but it's just off the plate. Villar unable to lay off. See if he goes back to the curveball here. Didn't get the inside corner with a fastball. VR gave up on the pitch, but it was too tight. Two balls, two strikes. And how about our PNC pitching performance on pitch tracks? Just misses on that inside corner. Breaking ball, fly ball to right. Hayward broke in. Now back a step or two. And he makes the play to retire the side. Houston strands a pair in inning number two. We're tied at one going to the third. Baseball was presented by Georgia Power, The Home Depot, Zaxby's, indescribably good, and your Atlanta area Mazda dealers. Same up to 40% off your ticket price with the Taco Mac center field steal. Get an outfield seat plus a $5 Taco Mac gift card for just $15 every Wednesday. Go to Braves.com slash summer. And get this amazing ticket deal. Boy, it feels like we've been on the road the entire month of June. And frankly, that's just about the truth. Braves only have had nine home games in June with one left to be played against the Mets. So we'll start off our next homestand on the final day of June 2014. So Gerald Laird batting ninth tonight for Atlanta. He'll be followed by BJ Upton and Tommy LaStella. Braves won, Houston won, game one at Minute Maid Park. And a strike. Fastball in the inside part of the plate. Felton just nice and easy. Easy like Sunday morning. Looks like he's throwing a little bullpen. Ball comes out 91 miles an hour and sinks. That's tough to hit sometimes. When you have that slow, deliberate motion versus a pitcher that exerts a lot of force in his maximum effort.
Well, Feldman's no kid. He's 31 years old now. The Astros have signed him through the 2016 season. He's back in the state of Texas where he began his major league career with the Rangers back in 2005. The best year was 2009 when he won 17 games. Just struck out Gerald Laird to start inning number three. Last year, Feldman is with the Cubs and Baltimore. And in total between the Cubs and Orioles, he was 12 and 12, made 30 starts, pitched 181 innings. And as you said, older than all their other starters, right? That's it. On a very sad note, Scott Feldman's dad passed away this year. Two days before his third start, he went out and had a great outing. But after that, has battled very close to his dad, Marshall Feldman. And this year's been sort of a lesson in adversity for him off the field, showing the young guys that you have to bounce back. A lot easier said than done. One ball, two strikes. Up to made contact his first time. He grounded out to short. And this one wasted way high at. Two and two. First time this year, Upton's batted leadoff. He's the fifth different man to bat first for Freddie Gonzalez this year. Hilton went to the high fastball. We'll see if he works the curveball now off that pitch. High fly ball headed for the Crawford boxes, and that baby is gone. BJ Upton has homered on a 2 2 count. And the Braves have jumped in front. How about that? And there's Freddie giving him a five. That's what happens when you question the manager sometimes, huh? So the high fastball, then he comes with a curveball that he tries to drop, just does not finish it for the strikeout. That's the get me over curveball, stays in the middle. BJ fooled a little bit. You could see that twitch, but still able to get enough on it to get it over that short left field wall. And Paul, as we talked earlier, that's the danger in this ballpark. It's 315 feet away. There is no margin for error for pitchers who try to get outs in the air to left. And Upton just in a pop fly that went 345 feet into the seats. His first home run since our visit with the Colorado Rockies. And his seventh of the season to give Atlanta a 2-1 lead. Alistella shoots one toward left. Grossman to the warning track is there and he makes the play. High fastball. Lestella wants in on the action. He wants some of that short left field porch. Just didn't quite get it there. Tommy 0 for 2. Here's Freeman. He hit one on the button, but lined it to George Springer and right. We've seen two homers hit in tonight's ball game. That should not surprise you. That is the way the Braves and Astros do a great deal of their scoring. Astros second, Braves fourth in runs via the home run by percentage. And Dexter Fowler takes care of Freddie Freeman. But not before B.J. Upton homers into the Crawford boxes in left field. His seventh of the season gives Aaron Harang a one-run lead as we head.
in Minnesota as Derek Jeter takes the field in his last All-Star game ever in what should be an unforgettable night. Special coverage starts at 4.30 on Fox Sports 1, followed by the 2014 All-Star game at 7.30 on Fox. Target Field will be the site of the All-Star game this year. Folks, if you haven't been to that beautiful American League ballpark, you are missing out. It is spectacular. And the Twins playing good ball right now. They're a couple of games under 500. And only five games behind the Tigers in the AL Central. Still have time to vote for your favorite Braves for the All-Star game. Still hoping that Evan Gaddis will get an invite either as a National League All-Star reserve or participate in the home run derby. They just voted the captains, Troy Tulowitzki and Jose Batista, the National League and American League respectively. The AL and the NL, now they get five hitters each. Okay. They get seven outs. And here's the deal. Fans get to pick three. It has to be considered by the captains. In case you wondered where Derek Jeter ranks all time on All Star voting, he's got a ways to go to catch the kid, Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> Just a little. But there's a a new format, I guess, for the home run derby, right? There is. You mentioned the number of hitters, but it's like a tournament now, is it not? It is, and they're lowering lowering the amount of outs, and then. If you do well in the first round, you get a bye to the third. And they're really wanting fans to get in on this. The, they're encouraging the home run derby captains to listen to who the fans vote for to be in that top five. So we got to find a way to get Evan Gaddis at the top of that list. Or we need to get Troy Tulowitzki's phone number on, on our air. Downstairs to Dexter Fowler. On the appeal to third, no swing, so a fast man's at first with a leadoff walk. Fowler just six for nine this year in stolen bases. That was a stat that really jumped out at me. And that's a three-two curveball that Rang just missed with his location right there. Fowler somehow, you're right, finds a way to get the first. Fourth in the American League with a 383 on base percentage. And seventh with 45 walks. He's got a big league at first for hit leader Jose Altuve. And that's taken a little low. Jose Altuve is our 18 2 reverse trivia question. He leads the American League with 103 hits. Named the last Astro to finish first in the league in hits. They've had some great hitters in this. Franchise's history. Is that a trick question? Because immediately I've got a player that comes to mind. Gretchen's pretty good. She could be playing us here. Yeah, it could be. What came to mind? Craig Biggio. That's what I wrote down too. That's almost too obvious. That's right. That's my point. One ball, no strikes. Fowler's running. Good jump. Hit and run out to base. Spikes up in the right field. Houston's got him at the corners with nobody out. Maybe that's why Fowler doesn't run. He doesn't have to. That's 104 hits for Altuve. And Houston, an immediate third inning threat. You're not supposed to do this in the American League. This is National League ball. Altuve just really easing up on his swing and slapping it the other way. Executed perfectly. Estella covering second base for the steal. Nowhere to be found. Well, with all the hype surrounding George Springer, he certainly lived up to it in his first at bat against the Braves. A 441 foot homer to straightaway center that gave Houston a 1 0 lead. As you can see, a fastball just over the middle of the plate, but a rank unable to execute. And as you said, 440 plus feet. Not many people can do that. Especially the other way. And 
This is the way swing uh, Springer swings the bat. I mean it's all out. Swing as hard as you can as often as you can. I really like how for Rang right now has thrown two breaking balls on the outside corner. Look like fastballs going straight down. Perfect pitches. If he throws a fastball here it needs to be for a ball. And you can see they're trying to throw the fastball up. Has to execute this pitch higher than high. It was and as we've talked so many times Paul that's a pitch that's given some of the Braves young pitchers an awful lot of trouble. It is and that's a setup pitch so you can now throw a curveball out of that same location. It looks like a high fastball but it's not starts out in the same plane same location. and can drop to that outside corner or even bounce it. It's nice to have a catcher who can block the ball back there as well in Gerald Laird. Got a little worried there. The throw over to first, and so Laird scooted in on the inside part of the plate. Was never going to go there, but gives them something to think about. Altuve leads at first with nobody out, and a good stop by Gerald on a ball in the dirt, two and two. And I can tell you, as a former pitcher, when you have the ability to throw a breaking ball in the dirt, and you watch your catcher go down and block it, you do not have to worry about a wild pitch or pass ball right here. Come very comfortable in throwing your breaking pitches in an 0-2 or 1-2 count. High hopper toward third. Chris Johnson fires to second for one. Simmons with a fake throw to first holds the runner. Fowler at third base. The Braves get it out on a high hopper to third, and runners are still at the corners with only one out. Excellent play by Chris Johnson right here. Watch him check the runner. Going to go to second base. Lestella knows that he cannot get him at first. Immediately turns his attention to Fowler. So now you've got a chance for a double play and a chance to get out of the inning with Singleton up there. He rolled out to second his first time up. And an outside corner strike. Just a nice, easy fastball on the outside part of the plate. Infield for Atlanta, shaded for the pull. You can see Simmons moving over up the middle, hoping for a rollover right here. Singleton ranked by MLB.com and baseball prospectus as the top first base prospect in the game. No balls in a strike. And that's outside. Singleton started the year in the minor leagues, finally got the summons to the big leagues, and was signed to a mutually friendly long term contract by the Houston Ball Club. Bo Porter said before the game that now that all of that drama, if you want to use that word, is taken care of, Singleton starting to settle in and swing the bat and play first base like the Astros think he can consistently at the big league level. You're right. Got in trouble a little bit with a marijuana charge and was suspended. Apologized. And they put Dexter Fowler to George Springer. Double play ball to short. Lestella the turn. Harang, what a job of magical pitching. The Braves do get the ground out from Singleton. Houston had him first and third with nobody out and cannot score the game tying run. We head to the fourth. Braves two, Houston one.
Sports Baseball brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. Paul Bird, Chip Carey, Tom Hart with you from Houston. You know, the last time we were in this ballpark, Tom Hart was battling for Rookie of the Year honors. He actually got to drive the train. <laughs> Talk about that in a minute. Help the Braves strike out hunger by bringing cans of food to Turner Field on July 4th. Get an autograph from Braves pitcher Chris Medlin from 6:30 to 7 in Monument Grove when you donate 20 cans of food or $20. Strike out hunger is presented by Kroger. For more information, visit Braves.com/strike. What a job by Aaron Harang. First and third, nobody out, and Houston doesn't score in the third. Now the Braves turn to Evan Gaddis in the fourth inning and look to add to a one-run lead. Harang with a beautiful job getting out of that last inning, giving his team some momentum. You know, Gaddis has a bunch of friends and family here tonight. At least you think so. Born in Dallas, Texas, lives in Forney, Texas. And reached for that ball and popped it foul to the right side. Singleton will give chase, and he's got no play. Hitting coach Greg Walker has talked about Gaddis, who's taken a huge step in covering breaking balls. Notice that front leg. Watch it'll stiffen up right there to keep him back so that he can stay back. It's a reminder to stay back on those breaking balls. And try to keep the head on it and drive it. That was a nice pitch by Feldman. But that has been the secret, he believes, to that hitting streak. And let's face it, if you cannot hit the breaking ball, you're going to get a lot of them. So once you show that you can handle reasonably well an off-speed pitch, you're going to get more fastballs. Three balls and a strike. Whacked foul back toward us for a full count. Tom Hart tells us that Evans' mom is here. Told you he's from Forney, Texas. That's 30 minutes east of Dallas, known as the antique capital of Texas. That's the mother bear. There you go. Hot shot. Dominguez with a backhand stab at third and a long throw to first. Gets Gaddis for out number one. Excellent play by Dominguez. Nice easy throw. You see that strong arm. And a little smile because that, that ball had a little hair on it. Coming down quick. So the base is empty for Hayward. Jason tripled and scored the first Braves run. That was in the second inning. Paul, I said at the start of the road trip, this was kind of a, a fact-finding mission. If you look at this Braves team in a very small lens. And the fact finding mission had to do with Jason Hayward. We know what he can do as a leadoff hitter. We've seen that over extended stretches. He was riding a very hot streak batting first for the Braves. But for this club that needs some more pop in the middle of the lineup, he's been batting fifth on the road trip and doing great work there. So, again, the question is is Jason Hayward a leadoff hitter or is Jason Hayward a middle of the order run producing hitter? I like him in the middle of the order because he can hit the ball to all fields. At least that's when he's going at his best. Has doubles power and home run power. He broke his bat and Altuve tall enough to grab that one. And a line out breaks Hayward's bat. He's out number two. And it's hard to have everything in the game. It's hard to have the best bullpen, the best starters, the best leadoff hitters, the best three and four hitters. And you just have to play the hand that's dealt. And the Braves really have never had any identity in that leadoff spot, a true leadoff hitter. So you have to find the right combination that works for you at the time. And that's a job that Freddie Gonzalez has had trouble figuring out. And it's really 
noticeable in this regard. The game changed and has changed back again. Leadoff guys weren't all that important 15, maybe 20 years ago, with all due respect, because PEDs made everybody a 20, 30, 40 home run guy. Now that that's been taken care of by baseball, those 40, 50 home run seasons are fewer and far between, and the game's pendulum is swinging back to guys get on, on base, going first to third, stealing bases. As that one's launched deep into the night by Justin Upton. But some things never change. Justin Upton's displaying some power tonight. That's the second homer hit by the Braves, his 15th, and it's a 3-1 game. Justin Upton strolling a little bit lately. He didn't look dizzy on that one, as that ball almost hits the train way up in left field. Absolutely destroyed. You think he knew it? What a sound coming off that bat. You can see the ball heading way out, just missing the train, hitting the D and Astros community leaders way up there. And down the lines, it's a short porch as we've talked about, but not in that area. Power alleys being 362 with an extremely high fence. Maybe that will get Justin up and going a little bit. As you can see that high line right there at 362. Yeah, when this park first opened, one of the really unique ground rule features had to do with that visitor's bullpen. As Johnson swings and misses at a ball in the dirt. And that's what we call a tease, Paul. We're going to keep people at the edge of their seat and explain what that ground rule was when we come back for the Houston fourth. BJ's homer, Justin as homer, up, up and away for Atlanta tonight. A couple of long balls for the Braves outfielders. And they enjoy a 3-1 lead in Houston in the middle of inning number four. Upton and B.J. Upton have homered, and the Braves behind Aaron Harang lead 3-1 in game one. Paul, it's time now for our fans to tweet their photos using hashtag SouthFanPhoto for a chance to have it shown in an upcoming broadcast. That's brought to you by AT&T. Matt Dominguez skies one out of play foul, and he's behind the count. Nothing and one. A fly ball to center. BJ drifts back and gets there for out number one. This is such a cool and quirky ballpark. 
for many many reasons we've talked about the Crawford boxes and how close they are to the plate inviting target for right hand hitters. That's Towles Hill named for Tal Smith who was for many years the longtime president of the Astros. That harkens back to today's old Crosley Field in Cincinnati that had a left field berm going up to the scoreboard in that ballpark in Cincinnati. And then as we pan left you'll see where the opening is for the Braves bullpen. When this park first opened. Right above those dark padded. Lines. That was open. And if a hitter had exceptionally good aim you could actually shoot a ball under the overhang and over the fence and into the bullpen for a home run. Now that's all covered up and the ball can ricochet around there and with funny bounces Paul. Makes this place a great doubles and triples or maybe even inside the park homers park. It really is. Notice in basketball they play on the same court right football fields never going to change baseball no outfield is the same. Totally different, very unique part of the game. Little pop behind third. Upton can't get there. A blue hit for Jason Castro, who's two for two tonight. So the Astros have a man aboard for Chris Carter, and the only man braver than BJ Upton and Dexter Fowler. And willing to challenge Towels Hill as our own Tom Hart. Tom. <laughs> yeah, you know, there aren't a lot of center fielders in baseball that like Towels Hill. BJ Upton told me today it's something that he'll just have to deal with. A couple weeks ago, when we were in Colorado, I asked Jordan Schaefer about it. He said he would always play kind of how BJ is right now in front of the flagpole. He said there's a reason behind that. He said, I knew if a ball got over my head and it was to my left, I could chase it on the hill, but I would never chase anything towards that flagpole. The flagpole, as you may note, is in play, and that means not only is it in play for baseballs, it's in play for center fielders. Jordan said it's one thing to go up the hill, it's another thing to run face first into a pole. That's never a good idea. Huh. But that's another cool architectural feature of this park, taking you back to old Tiger Stadium or old Yankee Stadium. Where the flagpoles or the monuments used to be in play before the renovations took place. 2 0 count. And found away by Carter at the plate. And I've got to say, with center field being 436, if you hit a ball off the pole at 434 feet, you're kind of deserving of something crazy to happen in a kick and you maybe get a triple or something. So. Not many times will a hitter reach out there and knock one off the pole. Now Laird spotted something from Harang who's fallen behind. Three balls and a strike. This is a situation where you're in the bottom part of the order with Carter hitting 190, Grossman 162, and Villar 206. So really don't want to walk anybody here. Want to make your pitches and force them to hit the baseball so you can be a little less fine. Have your catch up, catcher set up on a third of the plate or even down the middle and give you that good low target. And harangue missed to Carter. Ball four, two on, one out. Second walk for Aaron in the game. And that is a dangerous stat to keep an eye on. Again. Like Fenway Park, like Coors Field, you as a visiting team never ever feel like you have enough runs in this place. And really up to 70 pitches already, Paul. Excuse me. And I agree. Rang up to 70 pitches. You really don't get comfortable, even if somebody has a low average and is struggling. At any time, they can hit that big home run. I told you of Robbie Grossman's struggles. Grossman came over from the Pittsburgh Pirates. He was one of their young acquisitions when they traded Wandy Rodriguez to Pittsburgh. Tonight he's playing in just his 35th big league game. And he skies one to deep center. Upton on the run near the warning track. Checks that hill. And he'll make the play on the track. Castro will tag at second and move up to third on a deep fly ball to center. By Robbie Grossman. Any place else, that's a chance for a three run homer. But as a pitcher, Paul, that's exa exactly where you want him to hit it. Here's where you get rewarded getting that big fly ball to center. 
BJ with a nice job tracking this ball. And Castro hangs up at second base, and the thinking is this. If the ball goes over Upton's head, I'm going to score anyways. But the outfield's so deep, even though Castro's not the fleetest of foot, being a catcher, he's still able to tag at second base and make it easily to third base without a throw. So VR is the batter. He lined out to right. He's it safely in six of his last seven games for the Strohs, but still just a 2.06 hitter. Strike one. Surprises me a little bit there that he went with the first pitch fastball instead of the breaking ball with a runner at third base. We'll see if that's the last one he sees and he starts to use the aggressiveness against the, against the hitter. Houston led 1-0 in the first on a Springer homer. Single runs for the Braves in the second, third, and fourth. Johnson an RBI double, B.J. Upton and Justin Upton solo shots. Houston threatens here in the fourth. And Harang missed outside. Top of the order and Dexter Fowler lurking next. And Harang continuing to throw fastballs, which you may feel he has better control of right now. But you're kind of flirting with danger if you keep going back to the well with the fastball to young hitters over and over again. Hot shot, base hit right field. That'll score Castro. Connor will stop at second, and Houston draws a run closer. It's a 3-2 game now. Big two-out hit for VR. And the walk to 186 hitting Chris Carter prolongs the inning. And now you got to face Dexter Fowler. Let's see what Dexter's done this year with runners in scoring position. He's done very well. In fact, with two outs and a runner in scoring position, Fowler's hitting 391 this year. That's nine for 23. But be careful here. And he takes a strike. There's that breaking ball, curveball again from Horan. For him to be successful against this young team, you're going to have to throw your breaking balls for strikes. Now we're late on a fastball. This may sound strange to say, but a very dangerous five foot five hitter is on deck. You definitely want to get Fowler here. You do not want to face baseball's hit leader. Man that puts the ball in play a lot, Altuve, with the bases loaded here. And you go from a 6 4 lefty to a 5 5 righty, which is quite a change. And yes, as a former pitcher, when you face a player, a hitter that is smaller, their zone is smaller. And not every pitcher can, can deal with that. Now a dangerous pitch. Three balls and a strike. It really is. Fowler, a good fastball hitter. Harang unable to throw that curveball for strikes. One of the keys for him behind in the count. It's tough to throw a breaking ball here. So I have to really execute that fastball. And Fowler whacked it out of play to the left. So the count is full. Two on, two out. Carter at second, VR at first will be running with a full count pitch. If you do throw a breaking ball here, this is where Laird needs to set up right down the middle of the plate, give that low target. You're going by the element of surprise versus location. Runners go, and Fowler took strike three over the inside corner. Fowler argues with Bill Welke, who rings him up. 
And Harang surrenders one, but not the lead. He leads three to two. Atlanta comes up in the fifth inning with Simmons, Laird, and B.J. Upton. Thinning here at beautiful Minute Maid Park in downtown Houston. Much different feel to this place, Paul, than the old Astrodome where the Strohs <laughs> used to play. But with the heat, the humidity, you got to have a dome facility, and this one, best of both worlds. We're right. on tonight. I remember that old Astrodome turf, the Cookie Cutter Stadium. This one with much more character. But you know, when they opened the Astrodome, it was considered the eighth wonder of the world. Right? Everyone in the 70s, 60s, and 70s starting to go to that multi purpose uniform round stadium. And I think the fans set back further where this has so much character. You're on top of the players. Well, fans may not. Remember this as Anderton Simmons digs in. The Astrodome originally had natural grass, and the roof of the Astrodome was glass, like a, a terrarium or a hothouse. Mm -hmm. And when batters would hit the ball in the air, the outfielders couldn't see it in the glare of the Texas sunshine. Anderton fouls one away, two and two. So the logical solution is okay, we're going to paint the inside window panes so that the sunshine won't bother the outfielders. Well, that worked, but it also killed the grass. And as a result, the Astros had to find a way to create an artificial playing service. And as a result, what became known as AstroTurf was born. At the Astro Dome. And they played it up. I mean, they had the ground crew guys dress up in spacesuits. They would come out with vacuum cleaners and vacuum the base pads. It was great. No fake grass inside Minute Maid Park, for this is a retractable roof. And Simmons takes one back up the middle, but Altuve had him played perfectly. And that took away a hit. One out. Getting back to where you'd like to see Simmons go the other way. That ball hit up the middle, which is great. Altuve just had it played perfectly. You can see that comebacker on the outside part of the plate. Feldman throws. And Altuve with a little jump skip and throw to first. 
That was a great story about the Astro, by the way. You are a plethora of knowledge. I don't know what a plethora is, but it sounds like a lot. <laughs> One out for Gerald Lair. And talk to him. They've had great history here. Killer Bees, Biggio, and Bagwell, and Derek Bell. Jimmy Wynn, Larry Durker. Pitched here and managed here. That one's headed back our way. Foul off the bat of Laird. There's Nolan Ryan, Mike Scott, Jose Cruz. Just a wonderfully proud history here in Houston. Nolan Ryan back in the Astros front office with the ownership here of Jim Crane. General Manager Jeff Lunau came over from the St. Louis Cardinals to rebuild this farm system, and he's done that. The Astros are considered, Paul, to have the best farm system in baseball. And they've had a lot of number one picks to be able to really build that system, and they've used those picks well. They haven't made mistakes. So they will be a force to reckon with here in years to come. Well, if you if you believe that winning in the minor leagues will lead to major league success, then the Astros are certainly headed in the right direction. Last year, their top six affiliates all made the playoffs. Three of those teams reached their finals. Two of those six teams won championships. And over the last two years, the Astros had baseball's highest combined winning percentage in the minor leagues. So Jeff Luno, plenty of things to smile about as this. Astros minor league pipeline which once was a trickle is starting to open up and flow very freely here. B.J. Upton's homer tonight. And this one's popped up to shallow right. That one will rattle around near the rafters as George Springer makes the play. And Feldman has a 1-2-3 fifth inning. His 2-3-4 hitters come up in a one-run game. It's 3-2 Atlanta. Where for a member and many members of the Braves traveling party, they spent the day down at the Space Center here in Houston. What opportunity did they have for that? Well, they had a perfect one because there's some Braves fans who happen to be there. I'm with a couple of astronauts right now, Captain Chris Cassidy. He's a Boston guy, so we want to stick with the <laughs> Atlanta side of it. Colonel Shane Kimbrough went to Lovett School in Atlanta, then to West Point, a captain of the baseball team there, and after flying Apache helicopters to Georgia Tech for a little bit before ending up in the space station. You know, I I, one of my favorite things about my job is I get to meet Braves fans who uh, are all over the country but never have met a Braves fan who's been actually in the space station. What was that experience like and how did you get into the astronaut program? Uh, I was very fortunate to uh, apply and get in through the Army and uh, uh, but then being in space was absolutely spectacular. I mean it's hard to describe. The views of Earth were, were really incredible. Just living in that environment with everything floating around and trying to figure things out was really special. You, uh, you had a chance to host a bunch of guys from our traveling party yesterday on the Braves off day. What were their reactions when they took a tour of the Space Center? 
They all had a great time. We had a great time together. Um, it's, it was neat for them to kind of see behind the scenes of what we do. Um, and, you know, they pay us back. We kind of get to see a little bit what they do. So it, it worked out well on both sides. Jose Altuve must look tiny from space. Harang handles his bunt and takes care of the first out of the bottom of the fifth inning. Uh, you know, given your experience, both uh, as an Apache helicopter pilot and, and being involved in uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and then being in space, do sports matter in the sense that you have an opportunity to follow them when you're busy at your job or when you have a chance to get that release? Absolutely. I'm a huge sports fan, and uh, the few teams I like, like the Braves, it's always, it just makes you feel like you're at home when you can follow them, whether you're in space or overseas uh, fighting fighting in combat. So uh, it's a special kind of thing I have in my heart for the, for the Braves and sports in general, so I do love following that. How long have you been a Braves fan, and what appealed what, what appealed to you about the Braves? Uh, ever since I was a little kid. So I was there uh, back in the days where not many people showed up, and uh, Dale Murphy and Bob Horner days, and uh, kept kept watching them and, and uh, growing growing to be more of a fan throughout the years. Talking to the guys who uh, made it to the Space Center yesterday, they said one of the things that really impressed them was the underwater training that you astronauts do. How does that help you prepare for zero gravity, or can you? Well, it's the best simulation we have for doing spacewalks, for sure. So, um, because the the actual space station's in the water, everything's exactly where it is in space. So, the muscle memory we get from training in that spacesuit, as well as actually being on the actual hardware, is it's can't get any better than that. We do have gravity in the pool, unfortunately, but besides that, it's about as good as you can get. 15 days at the International Space Station for you back in 2008. What did you miss most about being on Earth? Well, I miss my family, of course, um, the most. But boy, it was it was tough coming home because I didn't want to. I mean, it was so fantastic up there uh, to be a part of a mission like that and, and to help out um, our country in that role. What's next for NASA in the space program? Well, we got a lot of exciting things going on. We have a commercial crew program, so we're hoping a commercial company is going to build a vehicle that'll get us back and forth to the space station, and then NASA is building a vehicle called Orion that's going to take us to deep space, maybe maybe an asteroid or moon or Mars down the road. I think the Upton brothers did that a couple of times already today. Shane, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Appreciate having you. Thank you. All right, Aaron Harang takes care of business here in the fifth. Braves looking for more runs as they come to the bat in the sixth. Moment is a little major league history as the brothers Upton have homered in the same game for the fourth time. That ties a ball for first all time on the brothers homering in the same game category. Jason and Jeremy Giambi have done it four times. Vladimir and Wilson, Wilton Guerrero did it four times. And now BJ and Justin pass Hank and Tommy Aaron for that first place tie. I like it. How about the charge that Justin put in that ball when he took the field afterwards between innings? They were playing a little Eddie Grant, Electric Avenue. And that swing was electric indeed. As I have no idea 
where that would have landed, but again, up by the train. And always fun to see that moonshot. Tommy Lestella leads off the sixth for the Braves and pokes one to the screen foul. One ball, one strike. Another cool architectural feature of this ballpark is the train that rides the tracks up above the left field wall. And the reason for that is that this ballpark is attached to Union Station. The old train rail hub in Houston as Altuve makes a fine play for the first out. Now we're so far away that the cargo that's in that train car up there, well, it looks like looks like oranges because we're at Minute Maid Park. But when you're in the dugout, ah, it looks to be deceiving. Those are very big oranges. Luke Pinella, when he was here, thought they were pumpkins. <laughs> he once said one of his players was trying to hit the ball into the pumpkin car at Minute Maid Park. And some of course to Lou. Uh, Lou, that citrus, not a gourd. <laughs> That's funny. So it's on my to-do list to ride the train. Really? Also to go to Wrigley Field and sit across the street atop one of the roofs. So what do you got? Which which do I need to try and conquer first? Uh, it doesn't matter. After a couple innings, you won't remember where you are anyway. Paul, one ball, one <laughs> strike. Freddie 0 for 2. He's lined to right and lined to center. Feldman hasn't gotten the ball on the ground an awful lot in this game. He has struck out five. But two long homers have cost him the lead tonight. There you see a nice change up from Feldman. He's really settled in, used all of his pitches. We've run the picket fence offense on him, putting up a one, two innings, two, three, and four. Just a little bit of damage each inning. See if Freddie can get something going. Here's that slider in. Feldman, the Astros opening day starter. There's three starts with biceps tendonitis. Usually keeps the ball down. He'd allowed six homers all year coming into tonight's start. He's allowed two in his first five and a third innings of this game. He took a shot the other way and fouls it off. Feldman, as you say, the third tallest Astro. Very tall. Gets that arm angle up top so that the ball goes on a downward plane. It's coming across the plate at a downward plane. The ball is in and out of the zone quickly, and it's hard to square up. I just thought of this. While you're talking about Feldman, in many ways he pitches very similarly to Aaron Harang. He does, both that tall. As you can see, most balls will come out lower, but watch this big arm action. Unlike Kimbrell, he gets it out away, starts it up here, and that ball comes at a downward angle right there. So as a hitter, you really have to stay behind that ball. It's coming down, like I said, at an angle. You have to hit behind the ball. To make things happen, I'm thinking of the big, tall Chris Young, pitcher with Texas. The guys would always complain about how hard it was to square up his fastball. And a guy that's not going to light up the radar gun either. It's like Feldman, but he doesn't have to. And that one too tight for Freeman. He missed inside. A one out walk. And that is the first base on balls allowed by Feldman tonight. That's something else he does well. He has very good control. Gaddis hits. Gaddis 0 for 2 with a strikeout and a ground out. Feldman does not hold runners exceptionally well, but with Gaddis at the plate and a short porch in left field, you're going to let him swing away. Freddie just with a, a nice, easy lead, not going anywhere. Houston bullpen begins to work as Feldman misses again. One ball, no strikes. Right hander Josh Zide is the first man up and throwing tonight. Houston has seven relief pitchers available for Bo Porter tonight. The bullpen has been used and has been hit hard in the season's first two and a half months. A strike evens the count. 
getting that pitch count up there, and you can see the shift on as Altuve is playing to the left of second base. And three fielders on the ground, waiting for that ball on the ground to the left side. That's the biggest shift as you will see in major leagues. Just saying, we don't think you have any chance of hitting a ground ball to second base. Big breaking ball. And it doesn't always mean that he cannot hit the ball the other way as you see the outfielders are playing straight up. So what they're saying is the chart shows when you hit the ball on the ground, it's on the left side. But when you hit the ball in the air, it can go anywhere. So we're going to play you straight up. Three minute first, one out, the pitch. And Candace all over that breaking ball and bounce into the seats. Got to watch yourself down on that third baseline. Ball had some steam on it. Breaking ball. Braves are hoping that with Gaddis as the DH and this lineup shuffle at the top of the order will spark them in interleague play. Work against the American League has been rough for the Braves and their DH since 2011. Just three home runs in over three years. That's hard to imagine. And out of play foul. One ball, two strikes. So when you have a National League team, you don't really have to prepare for a DH. So a lot of your position players are going to be defensive replacements, like a Romero Pena, who just is going to come in and do the job defensively, give somebody a spell. You don't have that big power hitter that big poppy like guy that's just supposed to walk up to the plate and hit. So when you Braves come to face an American League team, they can be a sort of a disadvantage. So you're saying that the way the Braves roster is configured is not conducive to an American League style of play because they're a National League team, right? Yes, you're not going to spend a lot of money and have a great hitter sitting on the bench just waiting for interleague as Fox tracks tells us. That ball was a strike. Little cutter off the outside part of the plate, down and away. There's the breaking ball. Got to spoil that. And that cutter down and away that they're throwing, normally that's the ball that if you can hit the ball the other way on the ground, you're going to drive it to the right side of the field. That's the ball that Gaddis pulls. He rolls over and pulls it. But if you elevate that fastball away, he doesn't always pull that. That's the ball he will hit the right field, as you've seen some of his home runs go out to right or right center field. So positioning the defense again accordingly. Let me ask you about Feldman. He feels he should have had strike three already, and he's got to throw another pitch or two to a dangerous Evan Gaddis. Is that the reason for the beating here? I think so. When your catcher sees bad body language like that, he runs out there and just reminds you, hey, got to do the job here. Relax and make your pitch. The 2-2 two -two for Gaddis. That was the ninth pitch of the at bat. Playing with fire a little bit there with your fastball in, as you see. He's getting to those outside pitches. We talked about this earlier, fouling off the breaking ball. Eventually, you have to throw something to the inside part of the plate, or that hitter scoots up, making the ball away really down the middle. So that last pitch to Feldman trying to keep Gaddis honest. Swing, fly ball, left center field. Fowler on the run, still going at the wall, makes the play. Gaddis hit it 402 feet to left center field, and Fowler tracked it down. He just missed. Well, when we talked about playing with fire, this is that fastball in. 
Nice sink to it, goes down and gets it. Gaddis does. Fowler runs it down. Man, that was a three iron. <laughs> 402 feet. You'd like to say hit the weight room, but you can't do that with that guy. And now let's see. The umpires are going to gather. I wonder if they're going to question whether or not Freddie Freeman re tagged on that deep drive to center field. And I watched that, and Freddie did hit the base on his way back. The rule on that being if you touch second base and start to head to third on your way back, you cannot cut across the infield. You have to go tag second base, re tag second base before you head back to first. That's Brent Strom, the Astros pitching coach. Their bullpen is busy. Zide continues to throw. And now Jason Hayward is the batter with Justin Upton waiting on deck. That's a pretty salty trio. Gaddis Hayward and Justin Upton. Let's check out the base running of Freddie Freeman on this deep drive to center. This is good base running by Freeman. He didn't need to stay at first base and try and tag. He touches the base right there with his left foot on his way back. So if that ball was over Fowler's head, Freddie would have been able to score. We are up the middle at shortstop for Hayward. He takes inside ball one. Feldman has done a nice job this game of running that fastball in back over the inside part of the plate and then mixing it with that cutter as you just saw that starts off on the inside plate inside corner and dives off. You know that breaking ball is coming yet hitters can do so very little with it. That's a testament to Feldman's talent. He's allowed three runs on only four hits tonight but is losing by a run. Those don't have a single tonight. He's got a double a triple and two homers. Bouncing ball. Look at where VR is. He gloves, grabs, and guns to first in time. And Hayward and the Braves are out in the sixth inning. Matt Dominguez leads off for Houston, and Matt's lead is three to two.
wearing the Milwaukee Braves colors here in Houston. Great looking uniform. Atlanta has always had great fans here in Houston. Spend the 4th of July weekend at the ballpark. The Diamondbacks will be in town. We'll have a great fireworks show, the best fireworks show in the Southeast for that matter. On Independence Day, you get a chance to see our old pal Martin Prado come to town. It's the Braves and the Diamondbacks. 4th of July weekend at Turner Field. Good tickets are still available, and we hope you'll join us. There you go. And that fan was old school, wearing the old Warren Spawn jersey. It's a strike to Matt Dominguez. Harang starts his sixth inning. He protects a one run lead. Dominguez, Castro, and Carter are due. And that's headed for the upper deck foul to the right side. Harang, with only seven pitches last inning, did a nice job of bouncing back after giving up a run in the fourth. He said he learned to pitch when he came over to Cincinnati from the A's, and Don Gullett sat him down. And said, I don't care what happens, you got 110 pitches tonight. I don't care how many runs you give up, you're staying out there for 110 pitches. Good luck to you. And he said he felt uh, a lot of pressure. Got into a little bit of trouble early in the game and said, Well, you know what, I'm out here. So I need to settle down, relax, and make my pitch. And it was one of the best things that happened to him in that small park in Cincinnati. We really started to execute and keep the ball down. Yeah, when Aaron was a kid with the A's, as Dominguez strikes out, he had a big fastball. I mean, Harang was a 6'7 guy who could throw a legit 96, 97 miles an hour. Father time has taken its toll. He can muscle it up to 91, 92, but that's not how he wants to pitch. Right. As you see, Favara warm up in the bullpen. That type of big arm that you're speaking of. And I agree with you. Father time takes its toll on everybody, with the exception of Nolan Ryan, who you saw sitting behind home plate, who at 44 was throwing 96, 97 miles an hour. You have to learn how to pitch if you're going to have a long career. There's Nolan. That was back in the day when you threw 170 pitches a game. He credits his arm strength to long toss, throwing from foul pole to foul pole. Line to La Stella at second. Castro's perfect night is over. He's retired for out number two. And Chris Carter will come up. So, as a pitcher, would you prefer being told, all right, you're giving me six innings, or you're getting 110 pitches? Which would you have preferred? Um, I like I like pitches because then if I know what I have to work with then I can adjust my game plan accordingly. No I balls and a strike to Carter. I think the key to the story is they really just said hey we trust you we want you to grow up we want you to get out of jams. We're not going to panic if you give up a few runs and get the bullpen up so that you're looking over your shoulder. It's your game to win. It's your game to lose. You got 110 pitches. Now go make it happen. And that's one of the big changes in the game. That doesn't happen much anymore because of pitch counts. I mean, somehow, some way, 100 pitches has arbitrarily become the line in the sand. We've talked many years on our broadcasts about stress of pitches. And there weren't many for Aaron Harang in the sixth inning. He got the Astros in order. One, two, three. He has struck out five and looks for a little insurance. That's your Delta Airlines. Two on deck trio. Braves three, Astros two.
Mazda game summary. And there you go, Aaron Harang with six strong innings. Home runs by the Upton brothers. And Mr. Springer has also put a charge in one to right center field with a solo home run of his own. Braves lead three to two. Harang has struck out five. He's retired seven straight. He leads by a run. And the Braves will take a look at a young member of this Houston bullpen. Josh Zide is in his 13th game. And really this is where you want to be when you face Houston. Their bullpen has had a ton of trouble this year. Here you see only 11 innings from Zide. ERA in the mid fours. You're going to see 91 to 96 miles an hour. A straight four seamer. As you see right there, no sink. And he'll throw a slider and a split. So everything hard. Those are the numbers I'm talking about. Last in baseball in ERA, next to last in save percentage, and next to last in most walks and hits per innings pitched. In fact, Bo Porter was talking about that very fact before the game. They had a series with the Nationals where they felt they had two of the games won, but the Houston bullpen just could not protect the lead. So now Atlanta takes dead aim at Bo Porter's relief core over the final three innings, looking to extend a one run advantage. And up in the skies, one foul. That's a really tough thing as a player when you think you have a game won. You get excited, the locker room, you're ready for that good locker room, the dugouts jumping. And then in a minute, you turn over the lead to the other team and lose. It really takes the strength. The Mental strength out of a team. VR at short, third hop, first out. One away in the seventh. And it doesn't give you confidence for future games when you're winning. Josh Zide was born in New Haven, Connecticut. And ended up at Vanderbilt. He pitched two seasons for the Commodores and then transferred to Tulane. Was drafted by the Phillies after his senior year in the 10th round and was part of that big deal that sent Hunter Pence to the Phillies back in 2011. So think about that from Houston's standpoint. They traded away Hunter Pence, the praying mantis, to the mm -hmm. Phillies. But they got Jared Cosart, who's in their rotation. They got Jonathan Singleton, who's their starting first baseman, and they got a key middle relief piece in Josh Zide for Hunter Pence, who's now with the Giants. And that's what Houston has done in each of the last three years. They traded veteran, high salary, valuable guys and have reaped great rewards in each of those deals. It'll be fascinating to see what, if anything, Houston does at this July 31st trade deadline. Chris Johnson chased one up and away a ball and two strikes. As you can see throwing that 95 mile an hour fastball very live arm. And speaking of Hunter Pence one of my favorite scouting reports ever by the Chicago White Sox runs like a washing machine in a phone booth. That's about right. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. I had a big guy, 6'4, 235 pounds. Was a starting pitcher until midway through the 2011 season. Now he's a full time pensman. And Chris Johnson has a one out single to center field, his second hit of the night. That's the first single of the game for the Braves, their fifth hit. Chris Johnson staying on that slider down. Here's one of the problems with the Zide. All of his pitches are hard. Fastball, low to mid 90s, slider, upper 80s, split, upper 80s. So as a hitter, you set that dial. You don't have to worry about a changeup. You don't have to worry about a big slow curveball. Everything is hard. And so Chris Johnson setting that dial on time for the fastball, reads the slider, and stays on it for that hit up the middle. That's where Simmons has tried to go twice tonight. He's fly to center and he's bounced out to Altuve at second. And a live fastball is off the plate. Ball one.
Chris Johnson not really a steel threat. Doesn't run very often. Nonetheless, Zide paying attention to him because it's late in the game. And his insurance run becomes very important. Time called. Simmons steps out for a moment. Braves begin play tonight. Two games out of first. The team they're trying to chase is the Nationals. They're also on the road tonight and have just surrendered the lead in Milwaukee. It's 2 1 Brewers. That game's through six at Miller Park. Here it's 3 2 Atlanta. Game one of our series with Houston. And that last swing chip was a little bit of a hey, I'm hitting it Minute Maid Park swing. Now a bunt, beautifully set up. Zide has no play. I get it now. I see what you were trying to do, Anderton. You overswung and fell down, adjusted your back, and then dropped the bunt down to third base at the last second, and it was perfect. A little slide move by Zide, but just not enough time. So the old Curacao cross-up got. The Astros here in the seventh inning. A single by Johnson, a bunt hit by Simmons brings up Gerald Laird with one out. And as a former pitcher, not many guys swing so hard they fall down and then drop a perfect bunt down the left, the third base line. See if Gerald can make some contact. Big hole right side for Laird as he takes high from Zide. So there we are again. The Astros pen, Paul, threatening to give up some more Atlanta runs. There you see Tony Sip warming up in the Atlanta, excuse me, the Houston bullpen. Bouncing ball back to the mound. Hesitation. VR hops, throws low to first, and not in time. VR was playing toward the hole at short, and that's why there was a little hesitation from Zide, and that's what threw off the timing, it appeared, and the Braves keep the inning alive. Altuve was playing right up the middle. That was his ball for a double play. It was Taylor made. It was over. They're talking right now about the miscommunication. Altuve, that was his ball. He was right there. But Villar came flying over. He's right there behind second. He didn't go. And really, Altuve should have been covering second. Didn't look like he was moving to the bag either. He wasn't. He stopped. You predetermined before the ball is hit who's going to cover second. It really made no sense to me that Altuve wasn't covering second base all the way. They're still talking about it out there. So communication breakdown for the Astros keeps the inning alive for the Braves. Let's see if B.J. Upton can take advantage. Upton homered into the Crawford boxes with one out in the third. He hits with two outs here. And he breaks his bat. Dominguez. Flips to second in time. No harm, no foul, despite the Houston miscommunication. The Braves get their first two singles of the night, but can't add to what is now a 3-2 lead at the stretch.
Atlanta Braves and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Atlanta Braves. Atlanta Braves Baseball was presented by the Georgia Lottery and Toyota. It's a battle of the bullpens in Houston. We'll explain why in a moment. First, we invite you to save up to 40% off your ticket price with the Taco Mac center field steal. Get an outfield seat plus a $5 Taco Mac gift card for just $15 every Wednesday. Visit Braves.com slash summer to get this amazing ticket deal. Feldman's out of the game after six innings of four hit baseball. The same true now for Aaron Harang, who allowed two runs on six hits. Paul in his six innings of work. He turns things over in the seventh to right hander Anthony Favaro. Harang, who pitched great today, bounced back from that rough outing. You can look at Favaro's numbers, that mid two ERA, and how about that strikeout to walk ratio? Doesn't walk many and can strike you out at any time. Makes it very versatile pitcher out there for Atlanta. Favaro fires something off speed to Robbie Grossman who took it for a called strike. Harang pitched everyone backwards early breaking balls finished him out with fastballs and even more breaking balls later in the game started to go to more of the fastball started to close guys out and start guys off with that fastball. Navarro going back to pitching backwards. Grossman VR and Fowler in the seventh. Chip, when I first got up to the big leagues and Cal Ripken would step into the box, I thought, oh my goodness, Cal Ripken's at the plate as you see the foul off right off Laird's mask. And I used to get scared and think, you know, I got to trick him. I got to throw him that breaking ball. And, you know, he was a professional breaking ball hitter. So obviously I gave up hits. And I found out later in my career that the older the player, the more their bat slowed down. And you could pitch those guys in. And it was the young guys that you couldn't get a fastball by. And that you needed a trick. As Vivaro throws that slider down. Let's see what Anthony and Laird have in store for Robbie Grossman. And that's belt high right down the middle, and Grossman took it. So Favaro's continued his good work entering tonight's play. He's turned in five consecutive scoreless relief appearances dating back to June 14th. And in that stretch, Favaro's picked up a win and a couple of holds. Those came against the Nationals. A good start in the seventh. One out for VR, who has an RBI single in two trips. Inside ball one. Slider just missed there. On that foul off where the ball hit Laird's mask, he does not use the old school hockey mask. He stays with that one that when the ball hits, you notice his mask came all the way to the side off his face, and he feels that that old school mask takes the blow out of the foul tips. And this is his theory, the hockey mask, when you see a guy that wears a hockey mask and they take a fastball to the mask, it doesn't move. So the head absorbs all of that punishment, and he believes it's one of the reasons that you see guys like Michael Barrett, Matheny, who have struggled with concussions since being out of the game. One ball, one strike. VR takes up and away. Big difference, too. Gerald's told us, Paul, that there's so much more padding in the old school mask. Not only does it absorb the punishment better, but it, on those direct hits, like you said, there isn't as much of a shock effect. That mask almost allows the ball to spring back. He took a wicked shot, you recall, in Colorado. Then on the next pitch, on a wild swing, got hit in the side of the face. That's the one disadvantage of the old school mask. Get hit on the side of the jaw, which was the fate of Laird when we faced Colorado. Two 
two balls, two strikes. And that nearly backed up over the corner. Tom? Well, guys, I've never taken a fastball to the mass before, but I did go back and look at the 13 concussions that put Major League catchers on the disabled list last year. Nine of those 13 occurred with catchers wearing the old school mask like Gerald wears. A fly foul out of play. I'm sure baseball is very aware of that stat. And I think Paul, they've done a much better job in recent years of not only diagnosing concussions, but treating them as well. In fact, Jared Saltalamakia just coming back from what is now a seven day concussion DL stint. That didn't used to be the case. It was 15 days if you were hurt. Mm -hmm. So a more protection for the catchers to take care of those blows to the head. That's a walk to the R, and that represents the tying run. He's a fast runner with 14 steals. And now we go back to the top of the order and Dexter Fowler, who's 0 for 2 with a walk. Tough to walk that. Ninth hitter with one out, and as you said, someone who can steal a base. So Rivara really has to pay attention. That's the way the AL team set up their lineups with the designated hitter. The ninth place hitter is almost a secondary leadoff man. And the way the lineup card reads for the Strohs now, VR, Fowler, and Altuve, a ton of speed ahead of Springer, Singleton, and Dominguez. You see Bo Porter. Well, the Astros, look, they're 33 and 44. Nobody expects them to make the playoffs. Ownership this spring said they'd like to sniff 500 this year. It's possible. A year ago, this club was 33 and 64 at the All Star break. They've already got 33 wins. In their first 77 games, so they're 20 games ahead of their pace for 33 wins. Certainly, Bo Porter's sights are set much higher than that, but they have made a lot of progress with this club this year. And a swing of this by Fowler, a ball and a strike. Getting Dexter Fowler certainly hasn't hurt. I agree. Guy, a terrific center fielder. I agree. One of their Bright spots in this lineup, hitting 275, doing a nice job in that leadoff position. It's hard to have your fourth hitter hitting 200, have a lot of young guys that are free swingers, and expect a team to win night after night in the big leagues. But like you said, you do want to see improvement. You do want to see guys getting better, and you want a manager that simply will get the most out of their players. The old saying, too, Paul, don't always believe what you see in March and September. For a guy like Singleton who's come up to the big leagues, he gets to learn on the job without the pressure of the Astros trying to compete for a playoff spot, much less a division title. So valuable or invaluable experience, I should say, for a lot of these young hitters and a guy like Dexter Fowler who's been through things before to get the lineup started. Yes. Runner goes. Good job. And Fowler ripped it foul. It's two and two. And back to first is VR. Fowler liked that pitch right there. If he could have let it go, it would have been tough for Laird to throw out Villar with that good jump. Sometimes when the pitch looks too good, it's easier said than done. Now the 2 2 to Dexter. Another throw over. As we we're talking about Bo Porter, he said to his young guys, he said, As long as you believe in yourself, I will believe in you. But if you start showing me bad body language and pouting and not running balls out, not playing the game the right way, I'm going to take you out of the lineup. Fowler went fishing and didn't get it. That ball was running away from the left handed hitting Dexter Fowler. And Favaro has his second strike out of the inning. 
Nice pitch on that outside corner by Navarro. That brings us back to our AT&T Universe trivia question. Jose Altuve leads the American League with 104 hits, including one tonight. Who is the last Astro to finish first in the league in hits? Any guesses? I'm going to guess Craig Biggio. That was what I was going to guess. So going back to my old days. You can say I'm the gonna, same thing. I'm going to say Jose Cruz. Very nice, very nice. Ha ha. How do you do it? Jose Cruz. Way to go. Is the answer tonight. There he is. Number 25, Jose Cruz. Jose Cruz in the house tonight. A ball's in a strike to Altuve. Smack toward third and past Chris Johnson, who's guarding the line. VR around second on his way to third. Throw oh. came into Simmons, who dropped it, and Altuve moved up to second. Nice piece of hitting right there by Altuve. An outstanding base running by Jonathan Villar. Watch as this ball is hit. Chris Johnson makes the dive. Villar doesn't break stride at all going around second. And I really thought Simmons had a play on Altuve at second base. Just couldn't find the handle. So now George Springer stands in. Springer hit a mammoth home run in his first at bat. He then tapped out on a force play in the third and struck out in the fifth. He's a man that has been described to us as Hunter Pence-like. The Braves are hoping that's not the case in the seventh inning, for Pence has been a Braves killer for a long, long time. So Roger McDowell talks it over with Anthony Vavaro. We'll remind you, game two of the series comes your way tomorrow night. Braves live at 7.30. Colin McHugh will pitch for Houston. Alex Wood back from Triple-A Gwinnett, stretched out and ready to go, gets the ball for the Braves. They're really making sure they have their game plan down. Obviously, this is a crucial at-bat, the at-bat of the game. And George Springer does everything hard, dives in the outfield, throws hard, takes BP hard. He has only plays the game one way. And in this situation where it is a lot of danger that he could leave the park. You really have to make sure that you make your pitches. Braves outfield plays him as an opposite field hitter. Huge gap in left center. And Anthony missed down and in. Dangerous pitch, but it missed. Ball one. And you can see that's a changeup right there. So he's giving him what he wants to see of something that looks like a fastball inside part of the plate that isn't. If he executes that pitch. Only one place for it to go if the hitter hits it well, and that's pull it a foul. Ground ball, Simmons perfectly placed. Vavaro has a sixth consecutive scoreless outing. He gives up a walk and a single, and Houston strands two more men. We go to the eighth. The Braves protecting a one-run lead.
Tyler BJ and Justin Upton. They have both homer tonight on Tuesday night Braves baseball. It's brought to you by your Atlanta area Mazda dealers. Fourth time in the big league careers of BJ and Justin Upton. They've homered in the same game. And now Atlanta looks to add to a 3 2 lead as they'll see a second Houston relief pitcher. It's left hander Tony Sip, who Paul has been a very versatile player, shall we say, for Bo Porter this year. <laughs> He has former outfielder from Clemson, now big league pitcher only. But on occasions, they have moved him to the outfield for a hitter, brought in a righty, and brought him back in the game to face lefties. You see that low ERA. And only two walks to 24 strikeouts. Extremely impressive. Scoreless inning against Washington on Wednesday. And twice this year, to Paul's point, he's played both pitcher and the outfield. That's happened to an Astros relief pitcher before. Remember left-hander Wesley Wright? Well, he played right field in 2012 and 2011. So that's part of the Astros pitching playbook. Have your outfield, have your relief pitchers be able to play the outfield. A lefty lefty start for Sip. Tommy Lastella is the batter. He's 0-4-3. Big swing and a miss. Steve right one. Tommy Lestella out of the gate, swinging first pitch. And you can't be fooled by Tony Sipp's smaller build at 5'11, because as you can see right there at 94 miles an hour, he can bring the noise. That buzzed the tower inside. One ball, one strike. Sip will also feature a, a slider. And then here's what I like a nice changeup. That's about 15 to 20 miles an hour off that fastball. How did Sip come to be an Astro? He signed a one year contract on May the 2nd. He asked for and was granted his release from the Padres organization on May 1st. He was pitching at AAA El Paso, the Chihuahuas, and he made 11 relief appearances there, two walks in 14 and two-thirds innings. Maybe he just got tired of hearing Jeff Francoeur chirping at him in the bullpen <laughs> for the Chihuahuas because Jeff's been pitching in relief some with the Padres AAA team too. That's a good call. But hey, he's, he's been good. I mean, and for a team like Houston, why not take a flyer on a guy like Tony Sipp? Broken bat out to second. Altuve's got it. And that's what makes it so difficult for opponents of the Astros. Their left-handed relievers held left-handed batters to only three hits now in 33 at-bats with Lestella's out here to start the eighth. Now Freddie Freeman the batter. Lestella going down getting that breaking ball. We've got another souvenir for the fans. Probably our sixth broken bat tonight. Tony Sip tough on those left handers, but Freddie Freeman hits lefties as well as righties. Really stays in there on that curveball. He stayed in. The pitch caught a corner, a strike. As you can see, hitting lefties at an even higher clip than righties, which makes no sense, but hey, we're going to go with it. To first, Singleton will take it to the bag himself, and that's a quick second out. Here's Evan Gaddis. Let's see how Sip fares against El Oso Blanco. And here's a situation where it doesn't look like Porter's going to do it now, but you have a righty in Evan Gaddis, followed by a lefty Jason Hayward, where you could potentially. Move Sip out to the outfield, bring in a right hander for one batter, and then bring your pitcher back in. The only problem with that is you lose your DH. If that happens for Houston and their DH is due up fourth in the eighth inning. So you have a left handed batter in Jason Hayward on deck, 
you don't have to pitch to Evan Gaddis here. You can work around him if you want and then go lefty lefty with a man aboard. We'll see how it's played. Agreed. You wouldn't do that when you're behind, but if you're ahead in the game where defense and getting the guys out are more important than leaving that DHN, you may pull the trigger. Some could call that overmanaging. Others could call that brilliant. It kind of depends on how it works out in the end. Well, Sip hasn't been too shabby against righties either. They're seven for 31 against him, a 226 average, and he struck out 14 of those 31 men. And he's jumped right ahead of Evan Gaddis with two quick strikes. But when you throw a fastball by Evan Gaddis, the big white bear, that means you got something special. Sip with that sneaky fastball. Base is empty for Gaddis. Three defenders left side of the infield. A one-two pitch. Back to the screen foul. Evan will see another. That was a nice changeup right there by Sip, even though it had a little bit of curveball action to it as it broke down. Sometimes when you do a good job of pulling back, pulling down on that changeup, it'll drop for you. Pulled a string and Gaddis fouled it straight back. A ball and two strikes still. Again, we've talked about it earlier. That's what Gaddis has done so well, according to hitting coach Greg Walker, is just foul off the off speeds to hang on and wait around for that fastball. Sip now, after slowing him down twice, and throw that fastball and at 94 after two changeups it'll have the effect of being 97 98 that one 94 and Gaddis missed it simple one two three eighth inning it's late in Houston the Braves lead three two and Jordan Walden perhaps on in relief next
tonight enjoying a 3-2 lead heading to the bottom of the eighth inning. And as we promised you earlier tonight, we have our AT&T fan photo of the game. Tweet your photo to hashtag SouthFanPhoto for a chance to be shown in an upcoming game broadcast. It's brought to you by AT&T. There are your Braves fans tonight. There you go, at Alpharetta Guy, where I've lived for the past 17 years, does Alpharetta, that, Georgia. Does that make the guy on the right, Dennis the Menace, if that's Mr. Wilson? <laughs> Just curious. That's a good call. Might be a question too big for Braves television. Romero Pena <laughs> checks in for the Braves defensively. He's in the game for Tommy LaStella. And Jordan Walden now appears for the 22nd time in relief. He's the second Atlanta relief pitcher in the game. These numbers are okay with that mid three ERA, but don't forget that he had a rough outing in Colorado, which we just call Colorado mud football. So we just X that one out, take those stats out. And he's having a good year. Jordan's not given up an earned run in his last five outings. Picked up the save, you'll recall, on Friday, tossing a perfect 13th inning against the Nationals. Missed 32 games with a strained left hamstring. And he blows one right on by John Singleton, quickly 0-2. So if you're a starting pitcher and you have four or five pitches like Harang, you can, if you want, adjust to the hitters, which Harang did tonight. Younger hitters, so he's going to mix his pitches. Jordan Walden, it doesn't matter. He's coming in. He's a freight train. You're going to see a stutter step in 97, 98 miles an hour. And good luck to you. And his effective release point is not 60 feet, 6 inches from the plate. I mean, he's a good 7, 8, 9 feet closer to the batter when he lets go of the baseball. And so what comes in at 94, we've been told is effectively 110 111 miles an hour it's it is back. he pushes so well off that back leg and almost jumps towards home with a little stutter step and throwing the ball so hard you see a lot of separation between that back foot and the pitching rubber when he lets go of the baseball he misses high two balls two strikes nobody on or out in the Houston eighth as you can see, watch this back foot right here. As it really comes off and he's got a good foot, foot and a half when he lets go of the ball closer to the hitter. And that one zips right on by Singleton who couldn't time it. He strikes out for the first time. And there's a good start to the home eighth inning. Walden strikes out Singleton. Here's Dominguez. Matt is 0 for 3. He too has struck out. Another thing I like about Walden is Avalon can get out lefties. So can Walden. Now we have Bookter in the pen, another lefty. But he's somebody that can get out lefties just as well as righties. Former closer in Anaheim. Well, he's facing a tough hitter in Dominguez, who's out of Van Nuys, California, and Chatsworth High School. His high school teammate was Mike Mustakas, who played shortstop at Chatsworth High School with Dominguez, who played third. Both were drafted in the 07 draft in the first round. Mustakas went to Kansas City. Dominguez went to the Marlins 12th. Which made, I'm sure, made his father and his family happy. Matt's dad, Fernando, is a copy editor on the Los Angeles Times Sports Desk. And that must have been a wonderful story to be able to edit. And he just watched his son walk with one out. And that represents the tying run with Castro coming up. So both Favaro and Walden have walks in relief. And Castro's the hitter. Four Houston hitters have been issued walks in the game so far.
Castro's a tough kid. He's been hit by a pitch eight times this year. He's channeling his inner Craig Biggio. <laughs> Starred for so many years with the Astros and was hit 285 times. I hated facing Biggio because he would wear that arm guard and stand right on top of the plate, never getting out of the way of the fastball in. And so, yeah, layered out for a chat. You had two choices to when you threw the ball in, or I guess three, you could hit him, right? Make your pitch on the inside corner or leave the ball over the middle, which obviously he didn't miss. How's he not in the Hall of Fame yet? Greg Biggio. 2,000 hits used to be an automatic first ballot. But Biggio will have to wait a little longer. The game has changed. Even 300 saves, not what it used to be. 3,060 hits for Craig Biggio, who played from 1988 to 2007. He's an all star catcher, all star second baseman, played center field here. Over 1,000 extra base hits. And a high pop fly foul by Castro. That's headed for the stands, perhaps, but Upton comes over and makes the grab. What a play by Justin Upton who reached into the seats to take away and at bat for Castro. What a phenomenal play by Justin Upton. Other guys didn't get out of the way here because they think they're going to catch it. You see Chris Johnson right in the way along with fans and along with the wall. Makes the play and watch this spin move gives the presence to know I got a guy on first base and I got to be ready to throw it in. Chris Johnson getting a little help from a security guard down there. So two outs for Chris Carter and off the plate. Ball one. There's Carter's. a first breaking ball by Walden. See Carter's line tonight. Dangerous guy. Five of his last eight hits have left the ballpark. He's got 13 for the year. Out a river down the middle. He took it. I was talking to Jeff Porter, Braves trainer, the trainer in the 80s, who said, you know, if you threw 90, 91, 92 miles an hour in the 80s, you were a frontline starter or a closer. Also showing you how the game has changed over the years. Now everybody throws mid 90s in the bullpen. And if you throw 90 miles an hour as a starter, that's average to below average. And scouts will tell you coming out of college and high school that they can't even turn a guy in unless he throws 91. Marwin Gonzalez is the pinch runner and a bouncy ball up the middle is through for a hit. Gonzalez around second. He's going to take third. BJ Upton plays very deep in center. And the Astros go first to third on a single up the middle. So Carter has two hits. And now a chance for Robbie Grossman. He's looking for some redemption. He's had a rough night with a couple of strikeouts. Fastball away. Carter does a nice job of just putting the ball in play. Something with that low average you don't expect to see him do. He's user all or nothing. As you in indicated, Chip, but he did a nice job right there, just taking a nice, easy swing and making it work. Alex Presley will pinch run. First and third, two outs. Grossman digs in. Presley started, stumbled, and heads back to first. And if you're wondering why Luis Avalon is not in the game right here to face a lefty, because of what we talked about earlier. Jordan Walden has a nice split finger that breaks straight down and is effective against lefties, also having a tough fastball on everybody. Grossman switch hits. VR, who's on deck, switch hits. VR's better average is from the right side. Grossman struggled from both sides of the plate. 0 for 3 lefty tonight. And that one caught a corner. Even count. A 
one out walk and a two out single has Houston runners at first and third. And Grossman had a good cut. But Walton one pitch away from sending it to the ninth. So it's one two against Robbie Grossman. He hasn't. He's been late on that fastball, but he's set up for the split, giving him options, and you have a catcher who can block. And there's that split that just missed off the outside corner. Had some nice run to it. You'd like to see it come in straight for the middle and go straight down. That broke almost like a two-seamer. Deuce is wild for Walden. Runner goes. The pitch outside. It's a full count. Another split right there by Walden. Just off the outside corner. Has really change up or two seamer action today. Not really coming in and diving straight down. That's an important swipe. A hit might mean two runs. 3 2 pitch. Swing and a miss. He struck him out. Grossman strikes out for the third time in the game, and Walden preserves the lead. We go to the ninth, Atlanta 3, Houston 2. Issued two walks, two hits, but Houston stranded four men in the seventh and the eighth inning. Real rough night for Robbie Grossman, who has stranded seven men by himself as the Braves maintain a 3 2 lead as we head to the fateful ninth. Marwin Gonzalez checked in as a pinch runner. He takes over for Matt Dominguez at third base. And Tony Sip back out there for Houston with Hayward, Upton, and Johnson. Ready to go. Atlanta trying to win its third game this year against an American League opponent. The Braves started the year with the highest winning percentage among all National League teams against the American League. But that's taken a hit with the rough start in interleague play this year. But a chance for a redeemer against the Astros in Houston. Jason Hayward tied the game for the Braves when he scored on Chris Johnson's second inning double. Hayward has tripled in three tries tonight, and he'll lead off the ninth inning. And that missed inside from Sip. One ball, no strikes. That triple in the second. You got to see Jay Hayes' great wheels going around first and second. He's got so many options as a player. He could be a high average guy. He could be a power guy. He runs well. Just has a lot of tools and really searching for a little bit of identity. Fly ball to left. And Grossman will catch that. Hayward's retired. One down. 
And it's funny how the game of baseball works. You know, every time you face a club, it seems, you have to face their best player with the game on the line. Looks like that's going to be the case for Craig Kimbrell because Jose Altuve, who has more hits than anybody in baseball, is due up third in what, for the moment, is a one run game. Bo Porter is going to go get the ball from Tony Sip. He worked a perfect inning and a third. As the Braves' right handed bats are coming on, he'll get the lefty out of there and go deeper into his bullpen. Fun game tonight in Houston. The Braves enjoy a 3 2 lead. We'll see how it works out for Houston's pen when we come back. Houston will call on Chad Qualls. He's their closer, and he'll try to retire Upton and Johnson here. Look at what Qualls has done. Nine saves in 11 tries. This is his 29th appearance of the season. Again, another thing that stands out to me here, Chip, is the walk-to-strikeout ratio. Three walks to 25 Ks, low ERA. That's okay with a guy that's lower velocity but when you come in with a closer type stuff throwing the ball 95 miles an hour four pitches it's very impressive when you only have a couple walks so Justin Upton will face Qualls First pitch is rifled towards center, but Dexter Fowler is going to grab that. So Upton flies out. His night one for four, and Chris Johnson the batter. Chris two for three with a double. Qualls has been around. He began his big league career in Houston back in 2004. And he made his way to Arizona, Tampa Bay, San Diego. 2012 a busy man the Phillies Yankees and Pirates and then last season 66 games with the Marlins where he won five lost two and threw a 261 ERA at the rest of baseball. It's a homecoming of sorts for Qualls he lives in Austin Texas. Many of those numbers part of an Astros bullpen that went to the National League Championship Series in 2004 and the World Series in 2005. And he still throws very hard 0 and 2. Different than Zide who came in earlier throwing a straight fastball. You'll see that good run falls fastball. He does have a four seamer. He has an excellent slider that he throws over 40% of the time. See if he goes to it here. It was the slider, and he got Chris Johnson on three pitches. Very easy appearance for Qualls. Atlanta's out in order in the ninth, and three more outs to get in Houston.
game in the bottom of the ninth inning. And speaking of Craig Kimbrell, you can follow the journey of his all-star career from the major leagues to becoming the franchise's all-time leader in saves. Join us for Driven, Craig Kimbrell, the closer. It premieres Friday at 10.30, right after the Braves game only on Fox Sports South. Kimbrell looking for his 22nd save. Kimbrell also looking for a redeemer. He blew a save on the 20th at Washington. So four saves, one blown save in his last six appearances. You see those numbers, 52 strikeouts and 29 and a third innings really jumps out at me. Extremely high ratio for innings pitched. Very different than Scott Feldman, who uses that 6-7 frame, extends the arm and gets the long torque to stay on top. He's shorter, keeps the ball by the ear, comes out of nowhere like a dart at 98. Kimbrell tried to nail down the 15th one-run win for the Braves this year. Houston has lost 13 one-run games. That an indication of the difference of the Braves and Houston bullpens. Well, you talked about the Braves getting into jams and getting out of jams tonight. I agree with you. They've entertained us all night long. They're all about entertainment. But we'd like to see a 1-2-3 out of Craig and see him nail it down. And you don't want to walk this man. And if there has been a noticeable trend for Craig this year, it has been a times fastball command. Yar is a fast, fast runner. He's 14 for 18 in steals. Single homer run, he's walked and he's lined out. And that one split the plate. That's a great point, Chip. I thought what hurt him in Washington was not the home run to Rendon, it was the leadoff walk that really cost him. And as you see right there, 2-0 count. You don't have to put the ball in the outside corner. You throw 98 from your ear. Shoot for the middle and let it work. Corner called a strike. VR not sure about that. Two and two. Well, we got a lot of booze here at Minute Maid. And that ball on the outside corner, according to PNC Bank pitch tracks. Two balls, two strikes. Top of the order and Dexter Fowler next. This is a tough call as a pitcher because you're throwing the ball by him. You have a chance to go to that curveball, but Kimball usually struggles with that breaking ball early. You have a choice. Try and throw it for a strike or go back to the fastball. What do you think is going through that man's mind as he watches Craig Kimball fire his upper 90s heat at these Astros? <laughs> Bringing back some memories. He's saying, that's how I used to bring it. Breaking ball to second. Pena to his left. Gets his man one out. That's what we talked about when you're throwing the fastball by guys. A little bit of a risk to throw that breaking ball. Number one, it's hard to throw for strikes right out of the gate. And it's hard to change pitches when a guy can't hit your fastball. Kimball did a nice job. And Pena, a nice play at second base. Beware the bunt for Dexter Fowler. The Braves guard the lines for Fowler. And even with the bags as well. And he takes low, ball one. Dexter had a good cut. One ball, one strike.
If you notice, Freddie Freeman playing right behind the bag, as is Chris Johnson. That's a no doubles infield defense. They don't want that ball going down the line and him getting to second base with one out. Ground ball, second. It rolls off the hill. Pena's glove, and Fowler reaches on a gift. Ground ball just hit him in the heel right there. Pena not able to get control of it with the speedy Fowler going down the line. Pena in for defense for Estella because he has better range. It's the right call. That play just didn't work out for him. So the best laid plans of mice and men backfires for Atlanta. That's an error on Pena. And now a world of opportunities available for Bo Porter. We told you about Altuve. He adds to his major league leading hit total. You've got a fast man at first. You can play hit and run, straight steal. You can do almost whatever you want. Let's see how they play it. And as you said, Paul, the difficulty for Kimbrell now, a very small, small strike zone. It really is. And this is the pay-per-view matchup that you want to see. This is what uh, I like so much about interleague. You get to see the best of the best. Lock horns. See if Kimbrell's able to locate the ball down. How about that hack by Altuve? He's thinking one thing, walk off. But it's tough to pull 98, especially when it's deceptive coming from your ear. Bouncing ball toward Pena. Fowler with a hop. The throw to second will force him. So Altuve trades places with Dexter Fowler. That's the second out of the inning. I like this call right here. Gerald Laird calls for a breaking ball. This is a tough play with a runner right in front of you. Pena makes it. He knows the importance of getting that runner out at second base so someone stays out of scoring position. Well, George Springer began the game with a bang. The Astros are hoping he can do the same in the ninth. He hit the second longest home run in this ballpark since 2008, his first time up. A 441-foot blast to straightaway center. So you want power versus power? Doesn't get much better than this in the ninth. The sound off that bat, pretty special. As you said, incredible power. This is a guy you have to be careful with. Similar to Andone, he can hit that fastball, especially over the middle. Altuve is running. The pitch is strike. The throw to second is late. And Altuve is in safely with his 27th stolen base. Altuve with a nice lead right there. Got a good jump, showing good wheels. Now here's the problem. You have first base open, so you can throw breaking balls. You can pitch around this guy, but if you put him on, you put the winning run on base. There's two ways to look at it. You may want to try and get this guy out. With John Singleton hitting below 200 on deck. Gives you some options. Fastball, 99 at the letters, one and two. Springer obviously pulling his head. He's thinking one thing, too. Two-run walk-off. Kimball a strike away. Here it comes. It's high, two and two.
2-2 here. He's shown him numerous fastballs. We'll see if he goes to that good slider. Fastball blew him away, and Kimball nails it down in the ninth. Kimbrell strikes out Springer, and the Braves have beaten Houston by a final score of 3-2. to two. B.J. and Justin Upton, big nights, and Aaron Harang picks up his sixth win.